Hello, welcome to this DCS general tutorial. Today we'll be covering missile evasion as far as classroom portion of it. In the next video in this series, I will be showing in-game examples, but we need to get some theory out of the way before we bother talking about that. So grab yourself a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, an adult beverage, whatever strikes your fancy, this is gonna be a long one. To begin, Let's get some administrative out of the way. On the left, we have a top-down view, an eye on the sky of our plane and an enemy plane. We have the X and Z forward and to the right, and the Y is up and down, so essentially through the page towards you or away from you. On the right, we have a side view, your plane, enemy plane, Y up and down is up and down, X is left and right, and the Z, which in the right hand view, or in the left hand view is to the right, is towards you or away from you through the page. That can help um, you understand what's going on in these pictures. So today we're going to talk about missile capabilities, Involving radar cones, differences, and evasion uh, strategies for Fox 1s, Fox 3s, and SAMs, and also how we need to manage or consider energy. Then we're going to talk about in plane maneuvers for dodging missiles. In plane is, say, in this left view, we are just operating at the same altitude. In this right view, we are staying at the altitude and we're not going up or down. We are in plane. After we talk about the in plane maneuvers, we'll talk about out of plane, which involves everything from in plane, but now we're adding the uh, up and down dimensionality to it. So not only are we going to be going left and right in the plane, we're also going to be going up and down during the maneuvers. After that, we'll talk about how engagement ranges can affect these strategies. Then, multi-missile considerations if you're trying to dodge more than one. And finally, we'll wrap it up with Fox 2 missiles and some general practices that you might be able to do to help you evade those types. Alright, so let's jump into it. At this point, I'm going to assume that you are familiar with your airplane's radar, um, locking people up, how it functions, how your missiles function. I'll briefly cover some overarching points regarding those, but here at this point in your learning, you should have a full understanding of your radars, your missiles, and the use of both of them. So as a recap, our Airplane's radar is going to come out in a cone, something like this. After that, we also have um, the enemy plane, also has a radar, plus the missile, if it is a Fox 3 type, has its own little radar cone. So for Fox 1 missiles, we are not worried about the missile so much as far as its tracking because Fox 1s are being guided by the airplane. So when we're dodging and we go into maneuvers such as notching, we are actually worried about the enemy's radar and not the missile. Our only consideration as far as the missile in Fox 1 situations is energy. If we can defeat the missile from an energy standpoint, then we defeat the missile. If we cannot defeat the missile in an energy standpoint, we need to defeat the donor radar's, uh, donor airplane's radar. This is the same for some SAM types. They will be guided by a donor. Say you have a SAM on the ground and he has this little radar dish that is going to have its own radar cone, and that's what we need to defeat to defeat the surface-to-air missile. 
if we cannot get out of the radar cone, then we need to defeat the missile using energy. Box three type missiles, on the other hand, we consider the radar cone from the missile and not the plane. I'm going to be talking about how we evaluate the threat and the situation from the time we get the missile warning and it goes active. So if they're using something like a something like a TWS mode, you will not get a warning that they have launched a missile until the missile itself goes active and it has defaulted back to the own missile seeker head. If they are firing in an RWS fashion, you will get a lock and a potential missile warning from the time they lock you up and not when the missile goes active. So things to consider if you're fighting a sneaky enemy, you will need to first evaluate the threat type you might not know if they're doing TWS or RWS, so it always pays to keep your eyes outside the cockpit for the threats. A nice way to figure out what method they're using and how you need to evaluate the situation is what your EW, your electronic warfare, your RWR in the aircraft is telling you. So for many RWRs um, and aircrafts, if you get a hard lock, um, like missile inbound tone, and say it says 16. That would mean that you are being locked by a F-16 um, hard lock RWS, and your missile inbound tone is not a missile inbound tone. It's saying that they have a hard lock and they are potentially guiding a missile into you. That consideration would probably fall into FOX-1, until you are sure that it is a FOX-3 missile and the missile has gone active, then you can default to these strategies. If you are flying along and you get a soft lock from, say, a 16, or no lock warning at all, and then all of a sudden you have a missile indicator on your RWR or EW coming at you, that means the missile is currently guiding itself to you and then we are instantly defaulting to the FOX3 considerations and not FOX1. Just some food for thought on some overarching strategies. That'll make more sense as we get into it, but just so we can categorize the threats as we encounter them. As far as energy goes, when we are fighting, if you're familiar with... Um, dogfighting tactics or old warbirds, it's all the same for jets. Um, generally, whoever has the higher energy state is going to win the fight. That is true here as well, except you are concerned with the energy state of the missile in comparison to your plane. The missile is automatically at a disadvantage because after the rocket motor of the missile runs out, it is no longer gaining energy um, for the most part and you can constantly gain energy with your engine. So you have an advantage depending on how you fly. So what you want to do if you're trying to defeat a missile in an energy standpoint is bleed the missile's energy. That way it'll slow down and you can easily maneuver around it. This will get more complicated when you're considering multiple missiles and different kinds of maneuvers, which we'll start to get into. But as a general rule of thumb, if we can make the missile constantly turn in one direction, then turn in the other, then turn again, that's going to make it lose a lot of energy and slow down, and that'll allow us to defeat it. One thing to note is that if you are doing vertical maneuvers, as I mentioned, the out-of-plane maneuvers, if the missile is going down, it is essentially gaining speed because gravity is helping it. So when you go down, we'll talk about this more in out of plane, it is crucial that you are going left and right during those sorts of maneuvers. All right, let's get into the meat of it. So to begin, we're going to talk about in-plane maneuvers. 
what does that mean? That means that we are not considering altitude considerations. We are only focusing on um, staying at the same altitude. When we're talking about the same altitude in plane, we are going to consider three different types of maneuvers. The first is going to be notching. So we talked about how a missile has a radar cone. These red lines signify the radar cone of the missile, and the screen line indicates the path the missile is traveling on. If the missile is in a FOX-3 state and it is guiding itself, if our aircraft is within its radar cone, it is going to track us. If we can get outside of the radar cone, let this be our plane here, perfect drawing. If we are outside of the radar cone, it will lose track um, and will essentially have defeated it as long as we stay outside of the radar cone. You might have seen in your um, flying, a missile might go flying off in a direction, and then as soon as a plane flies in front of it, it starts to track again. That's because you're going inside the radar cone. So the term notching means to fly outside of the radar cone's view. Now we can do this easily in a defensive standpoint by keeping the missile on what's called R3 or R9 line. If you imagine a clock around our aircraft, we have three o'clock and nine o'clock and an imaginary line going straight through our plane. So our three line will be off our right hand side and our nine line will be off our left. If we are keeping the missile on our 3-9 line, it means we are essentially flying um, directly perpendicular to the missile. As we fly, the missile is going to correct what it is doing. So we need to constantly keep it on our 3-9 line. So as we move off to the side, the missile is going to correct to try and catch us. It's going to correct in such a way where it is trying to predict where we are going to be. So it is not going to fly directly at us. It's going to fly somewhat towards the direction we're going so it can intercept. As the missile is traveling towards us and compensating for what we do, we also need to compensate for what the missile is doing. So we are going to constantly rotate and keep the missile on our 3 or our 9 line. And as we do that and we fly, the missile is going to correct. And it's just a dance as we fly. We keep it like that. And it's going to make the missile constantly correct what it is doing, losing energy, until eventually it will fly right past us, because it doesn't have the speed to keep up. That is great for um, being purely defensive, but if we need to start lobbing missiles back at a threat, we need to start considering what is referred to as an offensive crank. During an offensive crank, we are going to be putting ourselves in a semi-defensive position where we still have the ability to engage an enemy aircraft as we are trying to evade their incoming missiles. So for an offensive crank, in the simplest terms, we are going to fly off in a direction, either left or right. In this example, I'll go right. We're going to practice the notching maneuver, but instead of putting it the missile on our 3 or our 9 line, we're going to put the missile on the edge of our radar cone. So if we have this target locked and we are evading his missile, 
We want to make sure that on our radar page, we keep the enemy aircraft either all the way on the left or all the way on the right of our radar. This is shown and talked about in my air-to-air -air combat videos for the various aircraft. Um, I'll pull it up here so you have an idea of what I'm talking about. So in the air-to-air -air example for the F-18, I'm engaging in an offensive crank at this portion of the video over here at 12 minutes. So I have a target locked. He's off over here somewhere. And we keep the target locked on the side of our radar. So that allows us to guide our missile in, still being offensive, but it puts us far enough off axis where we can practice this offensive crank maneuver and not be flying directly at the missile. Every aircraft will have a different uh, amount off bore that you can be with the radar. In the 18, for example, we want to be about 60, 65 degrees off bore. This number in the 18 is shown in the middle of this radar. Probably won't be able to read that. Um, because essentially double YouTube compression from a video plus this video. But you can always pull up this video on your own and watch it. So as we're keeping the enemy aircraft on the edge of our radar page, we're going to be doing these maneuvers for the offensive crank. So as we go this way, once we have the missile warning, we're going to turn, wait a few seconds, and then turn back the other direction. When we turn back, we have the opportunity to assess the situation and then potentially fire a missile at the enemy. Or if it's unsafe, we can continue our dodge maneuvers and then potentially re-engage and just repeat the process. As we are going, doing our uh, left and right, the missile is going to have, to have to constantly try and compensate for what we're doing. So here, it will have to try to compensate for this initial turn going this way, and then as soon as we turn back, the missile is going to have to compensate the other way, and it will just have to constantly bleed energy, giving us a chance to evade, either by going outside of its radar cone, or by just bleeding its energy. This image I have adapted and changed a little bit from a user called Cruiser, he published an F-18 quick reference handbook oh, a couple of years back now, and he has a neat little diagram. He had some extra info on here that I don't find too relevant or somewhat outdated, but this shows exactly what I'm talking about. So when you have the missile warning and the missiles coming in, we're going to start our brake, our crank, left or right. We're going to continue for a certain amount of time, depending on the engagement distances. If the missile is closer, we have less time, so we cannot maintain. If the missile is further away, we can maintain and then commence the maneuver. We'll fly in, fire a missile, and then continue either cranks or we'll get into a defensive turn. Very useful strategy to visualize and then put into practice because as we're doing these maneuvers, the missile, as we see with this cone and knowing it has to lead us, if we are flying at an extremely high rate of speed, the missile is going to have to correct way off in this direction. And then we will make our turn. And then depending on the uh, severity of our turn back, the missile is going to have to recorrect. So at this point, say the missile is here. If we just turn to here, the missile is going to have to correct like that to hit us. If we turn extreme enough to go out in this direction, the missile is going to have to correct all the way out here. So the more extreme these turns, as long as we're going at a high rate of speed, the missile is going to have to correct more and lose more energy. 
I'll show you another visualization of this. So the missile's constantly correcting. I need to get this point across because it's extremely important to conceptualize. So at this point during this turn, the missile in the beginning is predicting right where we are. Then as we're making our maneuver, it's constantly updating where it needs to be to hit you. Speed is life. If you are going fast, it has to correct much more than if you are going slow. If we make a very lazy turn, like this, the missile essentially has a huge opportunity to hit us because we are flying into the missile. Change the color here so it's a little easier to see. So when we're in this section of the turn here, the missile only has to correct like this. Instead of if we did an extreme maneuver, and did something like this, like we see over here, because the missile is going to have to first be correcting way out here for the initial leg, and then on the second leg, it's going to have to correct way out here. Very important to manage how hard you're pulling your stick and your uh, turn rates during these maneuvers. Now let's talk about the defensive turn. So knowing how to not notch and do the offensive crank is extremely important so you can remain competitive in the fight. If you're defensive all the time, you're just going to be dodging missiles and letting the enemy get closer and then fire more deadly missiles at you, which will be harder and harder to dodge. So it's always a good idea to fire one back at them to keep them thinking about your missiles and not being able to maneuver in on you for a kill. Even if you are outside of your engagement range or you think the missile won't hit, it's always good to have something in the air to give them something to think about. So if we are doing our crank and then all of a sudden we get to this point and we see a missile is extremely close to us, let's do one of these. We see this missile is here now. We know that we do not have enough time to continue our maneuvers either in that direction or to maintain because the missile is so close and we're assuming it has so much energy left it's going to hit us. So what we want to do is engage in a defensive turn. This is essentially doing a full 360 loop. So at this point, we are going to, once again, instead of maintaining or continuing a crank, we're going to actually turn cold, turn away, keeping our speed up all the time, and then come back around. When we're at this point in our turn at the apex of the circle, we can look across our canopy, reevaluate the situation for what the enemy is doing. And then if we wish, we can turn in to engage and then resume the offensive cranks. Or if the threat is extremely dire and we don't think we'll survive doing this kind of thing, we can turn back around and then do another defensive turn and just repeat the process making circles as we go. So we'll get to this point, evaluate the situation, either turn in or turn out. One thing to note as you're doing these turns is to remember how the missile has to predict what you are doing in order to hit you. It's going to calculate that intercept. So if we're here and we initiate our turn, get a nice color in there. So we initiate our loop. That's a better color. So we initiate our loop if we do an extremely tight turn, the missile, it's the same situation as we saw before, doesn't have to correct as much uh, to be able to hit us. If we do a larger loop, not only does the missile have to constantly correct for where it thinks we're going to be, 
it is also having to chase us down. So something to consider if you're ever engaging the defensive turns is if the situation allows it, you want this defensive turn to be nice and wide to allow you to keep your speed up and also to drag the missile's energy down. So essentially during portions of this turn, you're running away from the missile in addition to inadvertently trying to notch it and run down its energy. And then once again, once you hit your apex, you can look at the opponent and then determine if you want to turn in to engage or repeat the maneuvers in the opposite direction. Now everything we covered for in-plane is going to apply for out-of-plane, except that we're going to be adding another element and that is uh, verticality. So as we do these maneuvers, these offensive cranks, or these full defensive turns, we are now going to be reducing our altitude. When you are dodging a missile, can't say this enough, speed is life. When you are dodging the missile, because we need to keep our speed up, we are going to use gravity to our benefit. Not only are we using gravity to our benefit, the lower we are, the denser the air, and the more drag it will have. So the lower we are, the more energy the missile has to expend in order to catch us. You're going to have a much easier time dodging things down on the deck rather than up in the air. If you're at 40,000 feet, odds are you're not going to dodge anything you need to get much, much lower to have a good chance of dodging um, any kind of threat. So how do we do that? So when we start our engagement, say we fire a missile at the enemy. So we'll shoot one at him. After that, we need to bring our aircraft down about 45 to 60 degrees, uh, angle 45 or 60 degrees down, somewhere in there, as we're doing our left or our right hand initial crank. So if I make uh, an axis here, real rough, so we have our 45 degrees, and then say about 60, not the scale of course. So essentially we want to bring our aircraft's nose somewhere in this sweet spot here. The degree to which you dive will depend on many factors. Above all, you want speed and lateral travel. When I say lateral travel, I mean horizontal, not just going straight down. If you go straight down and not on an angle, the missile is not going to have to correct left and right to hit you. It's only going to have to go down. So if you go down, missile goes down it's not losing energy maybe a little bit but it's gaining speed because gravity is helping it we want it to be losing as much energy as possible so if you go down just straight down the missile goes straight down you are losing all your altitude and not getting any benefits for it if we go at 45 degrees we'll start at one end of the spectrum so if we go down at 45 degrees The missile will have to go down at 45, but if we're also coming to the left or the right, the missile is going to have to go to the left or the right. The 45 degrees gives us travel in one direction, so the missile is not having to go straight down, and it will help us in the notching that we discussed earlier. The larger our lateral movement, this lateral movement here, the easier it will be to get out of the missile's um, radar cone if it's guiding itself. Now let's consider the opposite end of the spectrum. Instead of going 45, let's go 60 degrees. So if I have a much bigger uh, vertical range, 
rate of descent rather than a lateral travel. The missile will go down further as well um, and will have less of a lateral travel. Now you might be thinking, why do I want to do that? So once again, it all comes back to speed is life. If we're slow in the beginning of our engagement, we need to go more aggressive in our angle, closer to the 60. If we are fast in the beginning, we can get away with not going so extreme and then leaning into the 45 degree end of the spectrum. Above all, we want speed, but we also want to make sure we're not putting ourselves in a situation that would be detrimental to us. See what this looks like in practice. So if we start our engagement, the missile is coming out of a, at us. We're going to initiate our turn and our dive. So as we do that, the missile is going to start off as we see. The missile is going to start to correct off to the side. And because we're going down, the missile also has to correct down. So it's coming out towards us off to the side and also going down. And then when we do our cranks, it will go in the opposite direction. It's the exact same as we talked about in the in-plane maneuver, but once again, we're just adding the vertical component. I show this in the air-to-air -air example video. I'll pull that up quickly. So, here, I have just fired the missiles at timestamp 11 minutes, 20 seconds, and I'm engaging in the uh, dive and the offensive crank. So I'm going to come down. I'm already pretty fast, so I don't need to go as far down. I'll probably stay closer to the 45 degree. Let's see how far down I go. Yep, there's 45 degrees right here on my HUD. I'm going to maintain this while keeping them on the side of my radar page. So this right here, I'm angled down about 46, 47 degrees, keeping them on the edge of my page. This is this section of the crank. So in the beginning of the engagement, after I fire my missiles, in this section here, I am doing my 45 to 60 down and keeping them on the side of my radar page. That is what this B-sweep here refers to. The B-sweep is your radar, and we're keeping them right on the edge so we can guide our missiles in. When I get down towards the end, notice my speed. It's Mach 1.75. Once again, because it's double compression, I don't know if you can see this on this video. You'll be able to see it on the actual original video here. But I'm going to slowly bring my nose up because obviously I don't want to hit the ground. But I'm getting as low as I can, keeping my speed way up. At this point, I'm reevaluating. I'm looking at my radar. I'm looking at them. I can see them out here. Yep. So now I am at this portion of the crank. I am looking at them. I'm evaluating if I want to turn in and fire or go cold and do a defensive maneuver. I determine I have an opportunity to engage, so I'm going to continue guiding my missile, and I will turn in. Yep, there we go, I turn in, and I'm going to re-engage. Once again, note my speed. I'm keeping my speed up, and I'm doing these maneuvers to dodge any missiles they're sending at me. So at this point, I am at this stage. I will fire a missile if I need to, and then continue the maneuvers. Extremely, extremely important technique that will help your survivability during engagements. Play this back for a couple more seconds. Here we can see enemy missiles are coming in. So I know that at this stage, it is not safe for me to continue trying to engage them. So I'm going to turn and do some more defensive maneuvers, come back around, and then reevaluate. See, these missiles are going to fly right by me. There they go. So during that, we could see that at a certain point, the missile just stopped tracking me. And it essentially 
uh, went dumb and it just flew off in this direction, even though I was in this section of the turn, that means that I went outside the missile's radar cone. So the missile was searching here, but I was here. So it had no chance of seeing me, and it just continued on its path of travel. Once I see that I have defeated the missiles, it's all just repetition of these steps. I saw that I defeated them, so I'm turning back in to re-engage. Fire off some missiles, all that good stuff, and you just repeat until the engagement is done. So utilizing these maneuvers will, and getting proficient at them will come with practice, but if you keep this, these strategies in the back of your mind, it will just help your survivability rate and your success as a pilot. Um, once again, this is for ideal scenarios. Obviously in this video, nothing is scripted and it's all um, fairly uh, advanced AI and in, in a dynamic situation. So you can see how effective it is. Uh, but in this classroom theory, we're talking about ideal scenarios. Things will change here and there, but if you keep these general overarching rules um, prescient in your mind as you fly, you'll be able to come home from a lot more than you would have um, if you were not aware of these strategies. Now that we've talked about in-plane and out-of-plane maneuvers, let's talk about how engagement ranges can affect all of this. Let me clear the canvas. So depending on your airplane, you're going to have different types of um, air to air radars. Here, for example, we have an 18 F-18 radar depicted something like um, the MiGs or the F-16 is going to have a um, missile range indicator here. Uh, some planes like the Jeff will have like a box with little triangles depicting your ranges. Um, I assume you know, once again, how your radar works, how your missiles work, so I'm not going to go into detail on figure, figuring out what those mean. Uh, but in the different portions of your engagement distance, you can use your lock on them to determine their lock on you and their engagement ranges. So if you are in the out of range portion and for some reason they fire a missile at you, you're going to have much more time to react and you'll be able to be more uh, lenient with your maneuvers because you have time. So if you were in this portion for some reason you knew you had a missile inbound, you could spend more time in this section of your crank because the missile has to travel further, so it has to calculate more lead, and it'll essentially be looking all the way out here. If you were in this section, the standard engagement range of your um, ranging indicators, pretty much standard, so that's what we were talking about with all of the maneuvers. If you were in the maximum probability of kill range, odds are it's going to be extremely difficult to dodge a missile, especially a Fox 3 type, um, because they're moving so fast and you don't have time to bleed the energy. So if we're in this section, we might be, oh, I don't know, 20 miles, 10 miles, depending on speeds and altitudes. And this missile is traveling extremely fast. So all of your maneuvers, you don't have time to linger here for two to three seconds in your initial. You're going to have to cut this down right away to maybe one second and then do a turn. Or if the missile's extremely close, you might have to go to uh, maneuvering based dodging. Maneuvering based dodging is essentially doing some of that pilot stuff where you can't bleed its energy with your regular maneuvers. Even if you turn cold, the missile still has enough energy to probably hit you. So we're going to need to uh, maneuver around the missile. 
So if the, this missile is coming directly at us, move this here. We are going to need to do something like fly towards the missile and then either do a barrel roll around it or try and do some extreme maneuvers where if we have this missile inbound here, we might do something extreme. So once again, you can either barrel roll around it, attempt to at least, or go down and then pull straight up. So this will kill your energy, but it's better than getting hit by a missile. So we go down to gain some extra energy. And as we go down, the missile is going to... Well, as we go down, the missile is going to have to drastically angle itself down. And then we're hoping, because once again, this is at these ranges, this is a last ditch effort to try and survive. We're hoping that if we can pull up, either we're going to be forcing the missile to then have to turn up and it'll completely kill its energy trying to do a 180 or that the missile is going to end up overshooting us during this quick maneuver here. These kind of things, ideally, you're never going to be getting into. But if you're in these close ranges and then someone fires a Fox 3 at you, you just need to keep it in the back of your mind that using the standard energy or cranking, notching maneuvers, odds are I'd say 80% chance are not going to work. You're going to have to fall back to uh, maneuvering based dodging. That is also how you're going to have to uh, deal with Fox 2s. If a Fox 2 is coming at you, it's the same thing we just discussed here, except because it is not radar guided and it's going after your engine heat, you need to do two extra things. When you are doing your, I like to default to the barrel roll, you essentially fly at the missile and then roll around it. As you're flying towards the missile, you got to wait until it's, uh, I'm not going to say right about to hit you, but fairly close. You need to bring your engine out of afterburner and then pop flares. So as you're doing this roll, you need to be popping flares the entire time. Staying out of burner so the major heat source is the flares. If you are um, trailing the missile behind you and they fire Sidewinder, so say we are oh back here and the missile's coming at us from this side. It's not going to be too conducive to do a roll over the missile if it's behind you. So we're going to have to do some extreme maneuvers like this, either going down, popping flares, staying out of burner, turning left, turning right, or once again, going down, going up, maybe doing a roll, um, popping flares the whole time. That'll really help your survival survivability rates against uh, heat seekers. Just like with the radar guided missiles at close range, when you're dealing with box twos at extremely close range and they're coming right at you, um, it really is a coin toss if you're going to dodge it. As you get more proficient in these kind of extreme aerobatic maneuvers, you might have better than a 50-50 chance. It might get up to something like a 70-30 to survive. Once again, all depending on the variables and the speeds and what's going on in the world. But that 50-50 coin toss on whether or not you're going to survive is much better odds of not doing these maneuvers and being guaranteed to be shot down. So something to practice if you have the opportunity to Generally, you don't want to find yourselves in these situations, but if you do, now you have some tools available to you to deal with it. As far as multi-missile goes, it's the same uh, everything we just talked about, except that now, instead of just managing a single missile, we now have to consider multiples. Get this guy, move him here. So 
So if we had multiple planes firing multiple missiles, we need to figure out which is the priority that we need to worry about. Generally, your air-to-air -air, um, RWR or EW systems will prioritize a per singular threat. And you can use that as a clue, or you can do it visually. So in this situation I set up here, this missile is considered our priority threat. This one is our secondary because it's a little further back. So I will start off being worried about this missile. But as I'm doing these maneuvers, I need to be aware of what the secondary missile is doing. So in this stage, I might be dodging the first missile, but I need to realize that because my maneuvers are focused on the primary, the secondary might not be uh, being evaded at all. It might be because of the maneuvers, but odds are it's going to be able to compensate. So you really do need to think of the energy states of all players involved and also how your maneuvers are going to affect what you're doing one, two, three, four, five steps down the line. I like to liken air-to-air -air combat, especially missiles, as a game of chess because it's not so much what you're doing right now that matters. It does to an extent, but you're setting yourself up for maneuvers down the line and you have to evaluate what the enemy or the enemy's threats are doing down the line and how it'll impact your situation now. So in something like this, let me clear the canvas. So in this situation, as I'm flying, I will need to, once again, maneuver based on the first. But because I have the second missile incoming, I'm essentially turning into him. So I'm giving him a much higher chance of hitting me. When there are two missiles in play, you can get away with these offensive cranks still, especially depending on the distance between them. If there's a 5 or a 10 mile staggered, you might be able to. Or if they're really close to each other, you have an easier time because they're so close, say they're less than a mile apart, they're both doing the same thing, so your maneuvers will affect them both. Um, but as they get staggered, it'll be more difficult. So if I'm turning into the enemy missile, even though, say, I might have dodged this one here and it goes off, this missile at this point in time could be right here and right about to hit me. So this really comes down to your situational awareness and determining if you want to come back around like this, if you want to do a full turn. You'll see this a lot when there's, I don't know, three, four, five missiles in play, depending on what's going on in the world. Um, you just really need to be aware of what's going on and practiced enough where you can develop your intuition and not have to think about it in the moment. You just react. It's not going to be an easy thing. It'll take some time, but with enough uh, practice and keeping with it, you'll develop that intuition and have an extremely, uh, I'm not going to say easy, but a lot more likely time to dodge missiles consistently and come back home alive. All right, that covers everything. Not everything, but all the important points for the classroom portion of Missile Invasion. In the next video, I'll show some of these uh, in practice, similar to how I did in the air-to-air -air combat examples uh, videos that I have up. You can always refer to those to see everything in practice. But the next video I'll set up in a bit more structured way so you can see these maneuvers um, under more ideal circumstances. I hope that helped. Thanks for watching. Hopefully your coffee didn't get too cold during this video.